copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 126. Regarding the body of a murdered woman found in a vacant house on Arlington Street. That's all. Rose and Rose. Amazing speed and efficiency of the police and emergency cars operated by the West's largest cities and counties make the best possible advertisement for Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Whenever you hear the shriek of a siren, when police cars whiz past you with motors racing at top speed, you can't help but think, there goes Rio Grande cracked gasoline. For it is absolutely true that more police and emergency cars are powered with Rio Grande cracked wherever it is sold than any other gasoline. Thousands of motorists have discovered that they can enjoy police car performance in their own cars by getting their gasoline from the neighborhood independent dealer who offers the same tetra as Rio Grande cracked gasoline that is used in all police and emergency cars operated by the cities of Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many others. Careful records of car operating costs kept by the West's leading cities, prove that Rio Grande Cracked is the most economical and efficient gasoline they can buy. It's thrilling to have such fast-starting gasoline in your car, to enjoy such lightning-like acceleration, to have more power than you need. And it's also comforting to realize that it costs you no more to enjoy police car performance. <laughs> Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department is unable to be here this evening, but he has sent us the following message. Well, Chief Davis has just come in the studio. Chief Davis, you're right on cue. You want to read from my copy? Good evening, friends. Fingerprints have so long been associated with police and criminals that the average citizen feels that he would be di disgraced if he were confined in jail, were his fingerprints to be taken and filed as a matter of record. This is a false attitude, and civic organizations all over the country are working to break it down. If every citizen in the country were to be fingerprinted, the work of the police would be much easier. I do not say this to infer that in the eyes of the police, every citizen is a potential criminal. Far from it. But universal fingerprinting has its serviceable aspects in many walks of life. It serves as a positive identification. It avoids many unfortunate mistakes. It is unimpeachable proof of identity. In the case you are about to hear, our work would have been much simpler in solving a baffling murder. If the victim had been fingerprinted, we would have had the murderer before he had a chance to get away. Fingerprinting does not imply a criminal stigma. It is a protection for every citizen. <laughs> hardware on the second floor. Whistling merrily to himself, Finus picks his way among the lumber strewn around the first floor, ascends to the pitch smelling new staircase, his footsteps echoing through the empty building. He gains the second floor landing. Stop. Oh. Oh. 
drive out to the Arnington house, meet the young man and his father, slowly mount the empty, unpainted stairs, stop, thicken at the top. There he is. She's lying on her face. Turn her over, Wendell. Yes, sir. Look, Lieutenant, her legs are burned and there's burned paper all around her. Hmm. Tried to cover up the murder, I guess. Here you are, sir. Impossible to make out those features. Flash beyond recognition. With this, sir. What's that? Neck of a beer bottle. Cap still on it. There are blood-stained pieces of the broken glass all around the hallway here. Yep. The murderer must have beaten her over the head with this beer bottle. I have never seen anything more brutal. If that paper had burned, the whole house would have gone up and there wouldn't have been a trace of the body. And which is just what the murderer planned. But why didn't the paper burn? Well, you see, it's asbestos paper. We use it in building because it's fireproof. Have you any idea who this woman is? No, sir, I haven't. Who are you building this house for? A finance company. Hmm. You haven't seen anybody around the place recently? No, sir. You see, we've been working on another job for the last few days. And there hasn't been anybody around here. Well, our first task is to get an identification of the victim. Better phone the morgue to take her in, Wentham. Yes, sir. <laughs> While Los Angeles newspapers scream the horrible details of the crime to a breakfasting populace, the detectives assigned to the case listen to the findings of autopsy surgeon George W. Camel. I find, gentlemen, from the condition of the corpse, that the victim had been dead about 48 hours. That would place the murder sometime on May 7th. Precisely. What caused her death? Fracture of the skull. She'd been struck three times by a heavy glass object, uh, which broke on the third blow. The murderer will undoubtedly have cuts on his hands from the broken bottle. His hands? How are you so certain that it was a man, Doctor? In my opinion, it would have taken the very giant of a woman to have delivered such a deathly blow. I see. There's another gruesome aspect to the victim's death. What's that? She was still alive when the murderer set fire to the body. How do you know that? Her legs were blistered from the fire. Blisters do not form after death. I believe she had lived for three or four hours after the attack. Anything else, Doctor? Nothing, uh, except that the autopsy shows that this was really uh, a double murder. I... I see. Thank you very much, Doctor. Not at all. Good day, gentlemen. Good day. Well, boys, here's the setup. We've got a brutal murder, a mutilated corpse, and not a single clue. No fingerprints on the murder weapon. No laundry or cleaning marks on the clothes, excepting a Marshall Fields label in the coat. Before we can get very far with catching the murderer, we've got to identify the victim. Any suggestions? Well, the papers are playing the story for all it will take. You better have them print a full description of the woman as well as pictures of her clothes. As for reports on missing persons and all that. That's a good idea, Jarvis. You will send the same information to Chicago police on the hunch that that label in her coat means she came from Chicago. As soon as the story is printed, we'll be swamped with tips and clues. Most of them, maybe all of them, will be phony. But I don't want you boys to overlook a single one of them. It's going to mean long hours and hard work. But you must not fail. Right. Lieutenant Klein's guess was right. As soon as the description of the mystery corpse and its clothes is published, hundreds of letters, phone calls, and relatives of missing women pour into the detective bureau. Scores of positive identifications are made and then run down to end in blind alley. Dozens of spite letters and crank messages are followed through, investigated, dismissed. The detectives work from early morning until long after midnight, sifting the plethora of rumors, tips, off clues. And daily the mystery deepens. The identification of the mangled corpse becomes less likely. A fruitless week goes by. And then the officers return to their original clues. Let's look at the clothes again. Even though there were no identification marks on them. Take these shoes, for instance. Notice anything peculiar about them? 
No. Just another pair of brown shoes. Yes. But look here. These shoes have had new heels put on them recently. If we could find a shoemaker who did that work, it might give us a lead. Yes, it might, but good Lord, man, think of how many hundred shoemakers there are in Los Angeles. It makes no difference. You've got to check them all. Okay. And look at this hat. It's unusual enough so that it ought to be recognized by the person who sold it. Yeah, but a picture of the hat's already been run in all the papers. Yes, but pictures don't show color. And look at the color of this hat. Bright blue with cream-colored feathers on either side. You'd never forget selling that hat, would you, Charlie? Me? I wouldn't sell it. I'd throw it away. Well, we've got to canvas every millinery store in town and see if we can trace our victim through a hat. You take as many men as you need for the cobblers, and I'll work the millinery. Okay, Herman. That's the block. I'll need it. And so will you. For days, Jarvis and his squad of men interview shoemakers searching for the man who put the new heels on the unknown woman's shoe. And for days, Klein, embarrassed, feeling out of place, enters millinery shop after millinery shop with the blue hat under his arm. Finally, in a shop on South Broadway. Oh, good afternoon, sir. Could I show you something? No, I'm from police headquarters, and I'm trying to find out where this hat was sold. Uh, did you ever see it before? Why, no, I haven't. Oh, of course I have. You have? Where? Mm -hmm. Why, there was a picture of it in the papers, wasn't there? In connection with the Arlington Street mystery. Yes. Well, that's where I saw it. Oh. Tell me, officer. Do you think, who do you think killed that poor woman? I haven't any idea. I'm trying to find out who that poor woman was first. Well, now, I've been following that case pretty close. And I said to my girlfriend last night, I said, Stella, you listen, you are you sure you never saw this hat before? Why, yes. Okay, thanks. Of course, I've only been working here a week. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? It's one of the girls has been here longer than a month. Well, now, there's Miss Baldwin over there. She's been here all a long time, maybe six months or a year. Call her over, will you? All righty. Oh, Miss Baldwin, dearie, will you come here a minute? Uh, now, as I was saying, I said to Stella, why, you're not even listening. Aren't you interested in what I said to Stella? No. Oh. Um, yes, Marjorie. What is it? What do you want? I have a customer over here. You well, know. this man, he wants some information. He's a police Oh, man. yes, sir. What can I do for you? I'm investigating the Arlington Street murder. I'm trying to find where this hat was sold. Did you ever see it before? Why, yes. Yes, I sold that hat. Now, it's You did? Street. Who did you sell it to? Oh, let me think. A um, Mrs. Uh, oh, it was a Mrs. For heaven's sakes, try to remember. A uh, Mrs. Who? Well, let me think. Um, Mrs. Dillon. Yes, that was her name, Mrs. Dillon. She came in with her husband. I remember quite plainly now. Somehow we got talking about Chicago. About Chicago. I used to live there, you know, and after yes, I... Yes, that checked. What Dillon. did this Mrs. Dillon look like? Well, oh, she was about the size of Marjorie here. I remember she wore a coat with a plaid collar. Coat and with a plaid collar. Yes, that's right. What did her husband look like? Well, I didn't like him very well. He didn't want to pay $15 for this hat. Well, anybody can see it's worth all of that. Oh, I imagine he was about 38 or 40 years old, medium height, and he had big brown eyes, and his hair was a little thin on top. He limped, too, but Brown I eyes, he... limp, hair thin. She didn't have a charge account, I suppose. Well, no, she didn't, but then uh, she... Also... Too bad. We certainly need an address to work on. Wait a minute. She didn't have a charge account, but she did wear this hat out of the store, and she had her old one sent to her home. Now, Say, this is too good to be true. Can you find that address you sent the old hat to? Now, try. There's just a chance I might have it here in my sales book. Let me see. That was about four weeks ago. I don't remember it was some address on Hope Street. Of course, it was so long ago. I doubt if I... Why, yes. Here it is. Mrs. C. Dillon, 940 North Hope Street. Now, it's... Oh, my one. dear girl, this is the first real lead we've got. I feel so good I could kiss you. Well, really, I'm afraid you're going There's to... There's one more thing I'd like you to do for me. What's that? Come down to the morgue with me and identify the body. The morgue? At the morgue, Miss Baldwin positively identifies the body of the woman she knew as Mrs. Dillon. Klein at once calls in his partner, Jarvis. And the two of them go to the address on Hope Street. 
Here's 940. Yeah, looks like a rooming house. Yeah, it is. See, here's a sign by the door. And I certainly hope this isn't another wild goose chase. No. I got a feeling we're on the right track at last. Yes? Are you the landlady? Well, I'm taking care of the place just now. Who owns it? My mother and father, but they're out of town for a while. And what's your name? Well, why do you ask? Who are you? Police officers. We're investigating a case. Oh, I see. Won't you come inside? Thank you. Have a seat, please. Thanks. Now, what's your name? Inez Thompson. Miss Thompson, did a Mr. and Mrs. C. Dillon rent rooms here recently? Yes, they did. When? Well, let me look at the register here. It came in on April 27th. Ah, they still here? Oh, no, they left a couple of weeks ago. On what date, to be exact? On May 7th. May 7th? Hmm, that's the date of the murder. Murder? Yes, we're investigating Yarlington Street mystery. But you don't think that Mr. and Mrs. Ah, uh, we don't think anything. We're just trying to find out. Did Mr. and Mrs. Dillon check out together? Well, that was a little strange. I was out on the night they left. I went downtown with my bowl and didn't get home until 10 o'clock. When I got back, I noticed that the Dillon's door was open and that their baggage was gone. But they'd left the money for the room rent on a table. Mm. Did they leave any notes? No, just the money. Didn't it occur to you that their departure was rather abrupt? No, I didn't think anything about it. Mrs. Dillon had told me that they were just out here from Chicago and they were looking for a house. They hadn't even taken their trunks out of storage. Did she say where the trunks were? At the depot. She didn't say which one. Now, what did this Mrs. Dillon look like, Miss Thompson? Well, she was about my height, a little stout, had light brown hair and blue eyes. I guess she was about 35. And her husband, what was he like? Well, I only saw him a few times. He was a little older than she was, and he walked with a limp. If my father was here, maybe he could tell us more about him. And where can we get in touch with your father? Well, he's in Washington, D.C., staying at 1052 G Street. We'll get in touch with him right away. <laughs> While Los Angeles papers carry the news of the identification, Washington police, at the request of Lieutenant Klein, are questioning Mr. and Mrs. Thompson regarding the Dillon. Next day from the Capitol comes the report. Well, Charlie, we didn't get much from the Thompsons. No? Well, what did they say? Merely that Dillon had told them that he'd lived in Chicago. Yeah, we already know that. What else? That he was once an intern. Yeah, it looks like we'll have to ask some more help from the public. All right. I'll have the papers carry a story requesting information about a man named Dillon from Chicago. Well, I hope the papers are more help than they were in the identification of the body. In the meantime, you cover the railway station for those trunks he was supposed to have checked. The published request for information about a man named Dillon has immediate and concrete results. The next day, the story appears, a man calls upon Lieutenant Klein at headquarters. Lieutenant Klein? Yes? I've come to see about these Dillon fellow you're looking for. Yes? On April 30th, I uh, showed Mr. and Mrs. Dillon a house that was renting out in Glendale. You did? What did this couple look like? Well, uh, the man walked with a limp. And, and the woman oh. wore a blue hat with cream-colored feathers on it. Why, uh, yes. That's the couple. What happened? Well, uh, Mrs. Dillon seemed to be very pleased with the house. She uh, she wanted her husband to buy it, but uh, he seemed to be in ugly mood, uh, refused to consider it. Asked him what uh, what his objections were, and he uh, he growled at me and he said it was her idea to buy a house, not his. They didn't seem to get along very well together. Well, I'm very so. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't know you were busy. That's all right. Come in, Charlie. This gentleman was just giving me some information on Dillon. Yeah. Well, I don't know. This gentleman showed Mr. and Mrs. Dillon a house in Glendale. If they were in the market to buy a house, that would account for Mrs. Dillon being murdered in a half-finished house. You mean Dillon lured her there on the pretext of inspecting it as a possible buyer? Exactly. Is there anything else you know about this couple? Did they give you an address or anything? No. Uh, as I said, Dillon wasn't interested, so, so I just figured it was no sale. I see. Well, I want to thank you for coming in with that information. Uh, it's quite all right. Uh, here's my card. If I can be of any further help... Uh, we'll call you if we need you. Uh, thanks. Uh, good day. Good day. Now, what's on your mind, Charlie? I found the drugs. You have? Well, where are they? In Chicago. Oh. 
You've been to Chicago since lunch, huh? Oh, stop kidding. Listen, I traced them to Chicago, see? Oh. They arrived from Chicago on April 21st on Dillon's ticket under checks number 615145 and 5. They weren't claimed until 6 o'clock on May 7th. May 7th again. No doubt that was the date he killed her. Yeah. Well, at 6 o'clock on May 7th, the man who gave his name as J.W. Jones bought a ticket to Chicago and rechecked the trunk. One on his own ticket was check number 351487. The other on excess baggage check number 10193. He left on the 945 train that night via Sacramento, Oregon, and Omaha to Chicago. Good work, Charlie. Get that information off the Chicago Police Department right away. Upon receipt of the Los Angeles officer's information regarding the trunk check, the Chicago police immediately set to work on the clues. Captain of Detective Halpin places the trunks from the baggage room of the depot to the residence of C.C. Dillon at 5420 Evanston Avenue, Chicago. A faded little woman answers the door when Captain Halpin arrives at the house. Yes? Is this the residence of C.C. Dillon? Yes. Is Mr. Dillon at home? Oh, no, I'm Mrs. Dillon. What can I do for you? You're Mrs. Dillon? Oh, yes. What's so surprising about that? Nothing. How long have you been married? <laughs> I don't see why I should answer such questions to a perfect stranger. I'm for police headquarters, and I'm making an important investigation. It would be wiser to answer my question. Police headquarters? Well, well, what's the matter? Nothing to get excited about. I just want to ask you some questions. May I come in? Well, all right. I, I'm sure I have nothing to hide. I suppose you may as well sit down. Thanks. Now, well, Mrs. Dillon... How long have you been married? Ten years. You've been married to Mr. Dill Dillon ten years? Yes. Mr. Dillon just returned from California, didn't he? Yes. What was he doing out there? He was, uh, uh, on a business trip. He brought some trunks back with him, didn't he? Yes. I'd like to look in those trunks. Well, I don't see why I should let you. It would be better, Mrs. Dillon. If you have nothing to hide, then everything will be all right. But they're my husband's trunks, sir. Uh, there's nothing in them that would interest you. Perhaps I am the best judge of that. Where are the trunks? In the hall here. They're not even unpacked yet. Oh, I see. Have you got a key? I, I think they're unlocked. Oh, so they are. Hmm. Couple of suits, shirts. Oh, Mrs. Dillon. Yes? Did uh, Mr. Dillon go to Los Angeles alone? Why, well, Yes. Then uh, how do you explain that the lower part of this trunk is filled with women's clothes? They, they're mine. I, I was going to join him out there. These shoes, yours? I, yes. Mind trying them on? Oh, there's no use pretending. Those shoes aren't mine. They're, they're two sizes too big. That's what I thought. Whose shoes are they? They belong to a servant girl named Minnie Quinn. My husband left me for her. He took her to California with him. What happened to her? He came back alone, didn't he? Yes. He, he said he couldn't go through with it. He gave her some money and got her a job in Los Angeles. Then he came back to me and the children. He was sorry. He apologized and oh, I forgave him. But I, I'm so ashamed. Where is your husband now, Mrs. Dillon? He's... He's out looking for a job. I, I don't know when he'll be home. I think I'll wait for him, if you don't mind. Of course, if, if you want to, but what is it you want to see him about? I want to ask him some questions about a half-finished house and a broken beer bottle and uh, Minnie Quinn. But I, I don't understand. You will in time, Mrs. Dillon. Now, please don't let me upset your household. I'll just sit in here and read the paper. You just forget about me. Well, all right, I... I, I was just going to the store when you came in. I, I think I'll get my marketing done. All right. If, if I'm not back by, by 4 o'clock, will you give the baby her bottle? It, it's on the stove, and she's in the back bedroom. I certainly will, Mrs. Dillon. Frightened, bewildered, Mrs. Dillon rushes out of the house, down to the corner, not to a market, but to a saloon. Bursting through the swinging door, she finds her husband standing at the bar. Carl! Carl! Uh, what the devil's the idea of following me down here? 
Can I have a minute to myself? Listen, Carl, I, I have to talk to you. Can't you wait till I get home? No, this won't wait. I have to talk to you privately. All right, all right. Come on in the back room here. Sit down. Now, what's all the hysterics about? Listen, Carl, there's a detective up at the house. What? Huh? Yes. He asked about your trunks. Made me show them to him. Are you fool? I couldn't help it. Oh, Carl, what have you done? What have I done? <laughs> He's waiting up there for you to come. He says he wants to talk to you. What do you want to talk to me about? He said he, said he wanted to talk to you about a half-finished house. A, a broken beer bottle and Minnie Quinn. Minnie Quinn. He knows about Minnie Quinn? Yes. And a half-finished house. And a broken beer bottle. Yes, Carl. Oh, what's it all mean? What's he talking about? It means I gotta get out of here. I gotta make myself scarce. You better go up and talk to the man, Carl. Hey, not me. Not on your life. I'm going away. Where? I don't know. Somewhere, any place. I don't want to see any detective. I ain't got nothing to say to the police. I'm gonna stay away from him. Carl! Carl, come back! Come back! <laughs> Terrified, Dylan wanders aimlessly through the streets of Chicago until late at night. Then he boards an interurban car, and a little later finds himself in Evanston, Illinois. Linking along in the shadows through dark alleys, he finally arrives at the tracks of the Northwestern Railway. For a half hour, he stands fascinated at the faint reflection of the signal light from the highly polished rail. Then from a great distance comes the whistle of the Chicago Limited. Dylan tenses, his throat dry his hands moist with the sweat of fear. That distant whistle is his summon. Horror roots him to the spot. Fear sends sharp, hot pains through him. Nearer and nearer, the increasing roar of the approaching limited. The throb of his destiny. The reflection of the red signal light on the rails becomes the face of Minnie Quinn leering at him, mocking him. And then the limited swings around the curve for the straightaway. And the huge headlight of the locomotive blocks Minnie Quinn's dancing face from the rails. And instead, his relentless roar bursts into Dylan's brain, forms words, screams. No! No! Will you let me go? No! No! Will you let me go? Herman Klein, Police Department, Los Angeles. Man named Dylan killed by train near Evanston, Illinois, 6 a.m. today. Stop. Apparently suicide. Stop. Answers description, Dylan. Wanted in your city for murder. John J. Halpin, Captain of Detectives, Chicago Police Department. <laughs> Further information about the true police cases dramatized on these broadcasts, we refer you to the Calling All Cars News, a fascinating illustrated publication given away free wherever Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sold. It's full of true detective stories, latest movie and radio news, and of a special interest to boys and girls, it tells how to get a complete junior detective or G-man outfit absolutely free of charge. Fifteen free gifts for every boy and girl who joins the Rio Grande Junior Police Department. Ask your Rio Grande dealer. Ask him, too, what motor oil he can absolutely guarantee to lubricate perfectly all the time. You will be driving soon in desert heat at high speed, and that's when most motor oil fails. That's why your Rio Grande dealer so enthusiastically recommends Sinclair motor oil. At last, he can offer his customers an internationally famous canned motor oil as low as 25 cents and 30 cents a quart. An oil that is absolutely pure because all useless wax and jelly-like filler are removed. It is this waste material in ordinary motor oil that makes it break down at high speed and in hot weather. Sinclair motor oils are guaranteed to give perfect lubrication. 
And every Rio Grande dealer knows how to scientifically determine the correct oil and lubricant for every moving part of your car. You can't go wrong if you use Sinclair motor oil. And the same gasoline so many police prefer, Rio Grande Cracked. Calling all cars, attention all cars. A cancellation of broadcast 126 regarding a murder on Arlington Street. The victim identified and suspected has committed suicide. That's all. Rolls and rolls. Frederick Lindsley, 